Okay, so here's where we were last time. Um, uh, we were uh, talking about uh, sort of the you know the connection of different kinds of ideas. You know, we've got these uh, start off with a bunch of application questions. You know, compute the mass of this, compute the work it takes to do that, compute the you know whatever the application might be, and we want to get to numerical answers. So how do we do that? Um, the first thing we did was observe that if we define this thing called a Riemann sum. I mean, really copying, just you know, uh, adapting as seems necessary um, the the single variable idea of a Riemann sum. Uh, then we get a construction that very naturally connects to a huge number of applications. Now, I, I mean, I showed you three of them, right? but nevertheless, I, I claim there's many more. Um, so that's nice and all. Um, then we saw um, that. Uh, by way of a, uh, you know, you're making a, I mean, we made a, we made a, a geometric argument to to kind of motivate the following connection. Uh, there's an algebraic way to do this. It's, uh, oh gosh, it's you know, kind of uh, uh, conceptually opaque, but very rigorous, but also beyond what we can do in math 212. But you can rewrite um, double integrals as iterated integrals. And the nice thing about that is that iterated integrals, you can compute, you know, I'm going to say uh, the old-fashioned way. You can use the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Because an iterated integral is, in fact, a single variable integral with a single variable integral inside of it, right? And each of those is something we know how to compute. Right? So, so this is the big strategy. Um, uh, by the way, this also explains why we need both. We've got to have iterated integrals because otherwise we don't have a way to compute double integrals. We've got to have double integrals because otherwise we don't have a way to connect iterated integrals to applications. Right, so they're both really important. Uh, okay, so please uh, don't bypass uh, this in a in a uh, uh, solution that you give if the question says, you know, solve the following application. What uh, unfortunately a lot of students do is they take the application, they instantly write it as an iterated integral and then go to a number answer. And there's a big conceptual step there, very important conceptual step uh, to make it clear, you know, why is it uh, that you're so sure, right, that that iterated integral connects to your application? It's because there's a double integral in there. So I'd really like to see that double integral. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, moving along. Now, uh, everything that we've done up to now, uh, we have uh, considered rectangles as our domain. And it seems like a natural place to start because I kind of, if you think about it, I mean, a rectangle is kind of a, a two-dimensional version of an interval, one might argue, right? Um and yet, it remains that there are non-rectangular things that we want to compute, oh, for example, the mass of. <laughs> right? Or how much volume is there inside of, uh, you know, the, there's uh, something, you know, sitting. Here, let me uh, make this three-dimensional. Let's draw a z-axis here. And, you know, maybe there's uh, some <coughs> something sitting up here, and I want to compute the volume <coughs> inside of it. Just because it doesn't have a rectangular base doesn't mean it's not interesting, right? So uh, can we do something along the same lines? And uh, there's several questions to be asked, most of which we're going to sweep <laughs> under the rug. Uh, one of them is what would be the definition? You know, if we're, we made a big deal about how the definition of a double integral is that it's a Riemann sum. And we got really, really careful about exactly what is the definition of a Riemann sum. And we sliced up that rectangular domain and got a bunch of little pieces how do you do that if it's not a rectangle? Uh, and the answer is there's a bunch of uh, uh, you know formalities that uh, have to get written down. And that's not what Math 212 is about, so I'm going to skip over that. What I'm going to say about the definition of a double integral on a non-rectangular domain is that conceptually it's the same morally. I mean, it's the same idea of take this thing and chop it. Yeah, it's not a rectangle. Sure. Right, if you say i goes from 1 to n, j goes from 1 to n, well, uh, I mean, okay, the, sure, there are little pieces over here, for example, um, that uh, we're not interested in that. That's not part of our domain. Right, so yeah, so we, uh, when you go to actually computing this thing, you've got to figure out a way to not include that piece, of course. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, this is something that we're not going to worry about the rigors of. We're just going to think about the logistics. Okay. Conceptually, though, the big point, you know, what is a double integral on a non-rectangular domain? We're going to take our domain and chop it up into little pieces. 
just like what we did to the rectangles, different details. On each piece, we're going to argue that, you know, for example, in this little piece right here, how much mass is there in that little piece? Well, that's a relatively easy question on that little piece because it's a little piece. Density times area, just like with the rectangles, right? Then we're going to, once we know the answer on each little piece, then we're going to say, look, add them all up. Right? Now, how to write that down formally? Yeah, it's uh, details to be worried about. Not in this class. Okay. All right. So uh, let me go back to drawing the uh, again a three dimensional version of this. Uh, let's imagine that there is a uh, maybe we're computing the volume under some surface, you know, sitting over this domain D. And uh, just for emphasis, you know, our domain is uh, this region here. Our domain is in the x y plane. So sitting over that domain, how much volume is there under some surface? How much mass is there given a certain density? Or how much, uh, yeah, whatever. Right. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to slice up my slices just like I did when I was uh, uh, justifying the iterated integral argument for um, for rectangles. And uh, here's uh, here we go. So let's look at, you know, as x goes from uh, a to b, for any given value of x, right, there is a corresponding slice. Oh, gosh, my picture is not going to be perfect. Forgive me for that. There is a slice, right? And I need to compute the area of that slice for all the usual reasons. Right? How am I going to compute the area of that slice? Well, the area of that slice in here, <coughs> just like we did for double integrals uh, for uh, for rectangular domains, I mean. Um, the area of that slice is an integral. As you move, you'll notice in the y direction. Right? And uh, so it's just like with double integrals uh, on, a, on a rectangular domain. Ha uh, basically, nothing's changed that we've noticed so far. Right? We take a slice and the integrand's a cross-sectional area. That area can be computed with another integral. What's different? There's one little microscopic thing that's different, and that is these bounds. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, where does, uh, where do I start with my y integral, and where do I end? Well, you know, I start and end at. Uh, well, it's, uh, I'm going to say these points. Right? These are where you start and end. Just look at the cross section that we're dealing with. Um, so these coordinates here. And I'm calling y1 and y2. And the big observation to make is uh, those bounds, as you can see, are determined by those points. And those points uh, are determined by curves. And no matter what x is, this curve tells you how to take a value of x and convert to the corresponding value of y. Said differently, the lower bound for the y integral is a function of x. You give me a different x, oh well, the, look at that curve, it's either a little lower or a little higher depending on where you are. Right? So when y, y1 in this case, depends on what the value of x is, it's the function of x. Okay, so function of x as you see there. And then uh, let's see here. Let's go up to, oh, I'm, I'm running out of colors. I'll use orange. Um, this curve here uh, is telling me about this point. You know, you give me different x's. There will be correspondingly different upper bounds y, and this curve, this orange curve, uh, dictates it. Okay, that's the big difference. That's it. Everything else, conceptually, it's the same. Uh, structurally, inside of the integral, it's the same. It's just the inside bounds are the only thing that's different. Okay, now we've got a huge mess. Let me clean this up. Um, okay, now I I, uh, <coughs> I I made the assumption in, in making this argument that we were doing our x slicing, uh, what I'm going to call on the outside. You might say we're doing our x slicing first. I'll come back and talk about terminology in a minute. Um, but uh, sure, if you are doing your x slicing first, 
Then uh, those X bounds are, uh, just look at where it starts, look where it ends. And then the Y bounds are the ones that depend on X. What if you're not slicing in that order? What if you're doing it the other way? It's totally analogous is the, uh, the answer. So, but let's uh, walk through it here. Uh, let's suppose that we're doing our Y slicing. Uh, I'm going to say first. So there we go. Y moving you know, uh, from uh, C to D, some starting point to end, some ending point. Got all these different various Y slices as Y goes from C to D. Now uh, we will focus our attention on a single Y slice. And on that Y slice, I'm going to do this in blue. As I go from there to there, notice X is going from some starting value to some ending value. What determines those starting and ending values? Well, these bounds, right, those bounds are determined by, well, where are these points? And those points are determined by two curves. Here is the curve that gives X as a function of Y for the lower bound. And here is the curve that gives x as a function of y for the upper bound. Same idea, it's just turned sideways. Right? It's morally identical. Okay, one little bit of terminology before we go on and do some examples. And by the way, I mean a lot of what we're going to be doing today is just uh, you know a different variations, uh, kind of examples of these same ideas. Um, this is you know most of the ideas really right here. It's, you know how are the details different. Um, but uh, anyway, one concept, one uh, uh, excuse me, terminological um, observation. There's a temptation to talk about uh, which integral is first and which integral is second. I, you heard me use that same same terminology myself moments ago. Um, although I did put a little uh, clarification in, I'll come back to that momentarily. But uh, here's the problem with the ter with the terminology first and second. As you're doing your slicing, let's look at the, this one right here. As you're doing your slicing, that's the first one as you slice. And then after you've done your X slices, then subsequently that's your second one. And so you can see the motivation for which one's first and which one's second. Here's the problem. When it comes to computing these integrals, I can't do the x integral yet. Right? The x integral, I don't know, it's integrand yet. It's the the integrand of that x integral is an a y integral I haven't worked out yet. So w you recall when we you know worked one of these out last time, when you do the actual integration, you do the dy integrating first. After which you know that that uh, you know the uh, that you know that inside integral, so you know the integrand of the x integral, and so then subsequently you can do the x integral. So the big problem: you, you use the terminology and say you know which which uh, which integrals first and which one second. Eh, it's ambiguous. Do you mean first as part of the slicing process or first as part of the integrating process? Either would be a reasonable choice of terminology. Um, let me rephrase that. Uh, either could have been the intention, and therefore neither is a good choice of terminology. <laughs> right? Um, so I uh, suggest avoiding that terminology altogether. Uh, let me defend what I said earlier. So when I uh, when I uh, I used first, I did say s slicing first, right? So that yeah, okay, that removes the ambiguity. Clearly, I was talking about that one because that's how the slicing process goes. Nevertheless, first and second, problematic. So I suggest the alternative, uh, refer to uh, the outside integral and the inside integral. Right, and again, there's no ambiguity there. If which one, whichever one's on the outside, yeah, that's first in the slicing and last in the integrating. Whichever one's inside is second in the slicing and first in the integrating. No ambiguity, perfectly clear. So try to resist the temptation to say first and second unless, again, unless you unless you put in that little clarifying uh, uh, detail. Uh, but uh, if you just want to make the easiest, quickest reference, inside and outside. Okay. All righty, let's get our hands dirty and do one. Um, here is a domain. Domain. 
Um, let's uh, ask uh, how I would do a double integral on this domain. Now, uh, before we go on, notice I didn't phrase any sort of a application question here. I didn't say, let's compute the mass of, or how much volume is sitting under some surface over this domain, right? So what the application is, uh, let's not worry about that right now. Sure, there'll be some application. There'll be some situation at some point uh, uh, on, for which I need to compute a double integral on this domain. I want to focus on how to convert the double integral on this domain into an iterated integral that defines this domain. I don't want to focus on what the application is. There's no need. Likewise, once I've got an iterated integral, yeah, there's the matter of computing it. Okay, we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll do one example of that perhaps. But nevertheless, that is kind of a separate part of the process. Um, there's really sort of three steps, you might uh, you might say, in uh, looking at this little diagram. You know, step one, phase one, if you will, of the problem of uh, solving an application is to relate your application to a double integral. Phase two is to convert that double integral into an iterated integral and phase three, uh, whoops, color. Phase three is to uh, compute that iterated integral with the fundamental theorem. So it's a three-step process, and we don't have to focus on all three at the same time. I want to focus on <coughs> number two for the moment. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, I'm going to make uh, a seemingly arbitrary choice here at the moment. Uh, I'm going to uh, choose my outside integral to be the x integral. So I'm slicing perpendicular to the x axis. So I'm going to go like this first. My slice is perpendicular to the x axis. By the way, uh, resist the temptation to call these y slices. Uh, it, it might seem reasonable to call these y slices, but y is not what's going on here. As we're going, as we're doing this sort of outside. The integral is outside part of the process. X is the variable at hand. X is what's varying from some starting point to some ending point. These slices, the point about them is that they represent a constant value of X. These are X slices, please. Right. So the fact that they're parallel to the y-axis is a coincidental and irrelevant point. Okay. I think I saw a hand somewhere. Did I? No. Okay. Any questions? By the way, I. Don't want to suck up all the air in the room and make it impossible. Yes. Um, on the slide, the avoid corners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get to that in a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, this is a seemingly arbitrary choice. Um, I, I am going to kind of punt on this one for a moment. I've got an entire page to talk about this later. Um, it, it is uh, going to be the case that you know, as we slice, it's we're going to notice later that if we slice. And from the start to the end, we never slice through a corner. Turns out this is a good thing. And we'll see why uh, a little bit later on. Notice if we did this the other way, then uh oh, we just slice through a corner, and I claim that that uh, is um, I claim that that's bad. Why is that a corner in that direction? Um, oh, I see. It's yeah, fine. it's just uh, so starts don't count and ends don't count. Yeah, but so this is uh, here we're slicing through this corner right in the middle of our right in the middle of our process, and again for reasons that we'll see in a little, little while that's that's bad. Okay, okay, so let's think about it. What are the bounds for our x integral? X is going like that. Here's what an x slice looks like. Uh, where does x start? Where does x end? Um, well, there are these bounds. Uh, this starting point, this ending point, uh, starting bound, ending bound. Um, here's the process that I want you to take when you answer these questions. The bounds that you're looking for, identify what points they correspond to. In this case, here we're, you might say we're starting at that <laughs> point on the left, we're ending at that point on the right. So step one, identify the points. Step two, those points, and what is it that defines that point? That point is the point in question because it's on two curves. It's on that curve and that curve. Okay, so step one, identify the points. Step two, that point is on which curve? Step three, identify what are the equations of those curves. Uh, here they are. Uh, whoops. 
Okay, so again, walking through the process. Bounds are determined by points. Points are determined by curves. Curves have equations. A little three-step process there. Once you have those equations identified, now what, here's what we can say. I am looking for the value of x. I'm looking for the value of x that makes these two equations true. And now it becomes an algebra problem. How can you find the value of x that makes uh, these two equations true? Well, in this case, what I would do is I, I want to know for what value of x is uh, this value of y equal to that value of y, because that's what makes uh, those two curves intersect. Anybody on board? Okay, punchline then, this is the resulting equation. Okay. All right, please always think through that process. Uh, don't, there's a, uh, a lot of students have taken a high school course in multivariable calculus, and bright as y'all are, you've noticed that certain things have, oh, for every question I ever saw, all I had to do is, you know, you take the <laughs> equation, the, the equations that you're given, you then you just, you just sort of noticed I, I just set these equal to each other or something and uh, I keep getting right answers so how could this be how could this be wrong right um, uh, there's all sorts of things wrong with that uh, point of view the sort of the, you know uh, doing the what seems algebraically uh, the only choice um, uh, it, for one thing it's not an argument right? and for another thing there are plenty of examples that we're going to see where if you take that point of view you'll just get dramatically wrong answers it doesn't make any sense um, and so, again, always make sure to have clear reasons for steps that you take, uh, else you're susceptible to getting wrong answers. But more importantly, you're writing down garbage. So um, always go through the process. The point, the curves, the equations, solve. Okay, uh, oh, uh, so uh, by the way, you can solve this equation and you get x is equal to negative 1 or 2. Uh, here we were looking for this lower bound, this lower bound. Oh, see, is, is that negative 1 or 2? we got to think strategically here. Um, you can't just say, oh, well, I'm looking for the lower bound and therefore it's got to be the smaller of these two numbers. That doesn't necessarily follow. Uh, what, if, uh, what if it were to turn out that this upper bound were determined by completely different algebra? Hypothetically, right? So you got to think about what is it that I know about this point, or the, this uh, this bound, and how can I use that to distinguish which one of these that I want? So easy argument in this case. Clearly, I'm looking for a value that is negative. Therefore, it's got to be that one. All right. Now, in this case, it turns out uh, trying to find this value B, it's determined by this point. That point is on these two curves. Those two curves, well, they're the same two curves. They have the same two equations. They suggest the exact same algebra, <laughs> right? So here, now we can make the, the argument that, hey, look, the two bounds that I'm looking for are both identified by the same algebra. Therefore, these two numbers are these two bounds and therefore yeah the lower one is the lower bound and the uh, the higher one uh, is the higher bound sure okay all right okay so we got those two numbers uh, negative one and two there you go X goes from negative one to two uh, now we're going to fix a value of X uh, for that value of X just like we did on the previous page we're now gonna move along like that in the y direction, what are our y bounds? Same process. The bounds that we're looking for are determined by certain points. Here they are, those two points. Those points are determined by certain curves. Lower bound point is determined by that curve. The upper bound point is determined by that curve. Those curves have certain equations. Uh, that lower bound equation uh, curve has that. The upper bound curve has equation that. And then solve for what you want. Again, now what we're looking for is we're solving for, don't lose track of it, we're trying to find a range of values of y. We're looking for y. So in these equations, we want to solve for y. Conveniently, hey, lucky break, by the way. 
<laughs> lucky break. It happens to be uh, sometimes sometimes things just sometimes the fish just jump in the boat. All right, it happens to be that in the algebra that we wrote down, y was already solved for. Don't assume that that will always be the case. It won't. Okay, we got lucky there. So, again, don't make the mistake of thinking, oh, yeah, whatever the, the equation, oh, yeah, you just take that thing, that thing, whatever it is, yeah, you, that's the bound. No, no not at all. Uh, lucky break in this case. Okay. All right. All right, let's see some more examples. Uh, oh, uh, no, so let, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's compute one. So, uh, using that domain, um, let's suppose I had uh, density as a function of x and y like this. Let's actually crank through and get an answer. There is one little twist that happens here. It's worth talking about. But uh, we argued previously uh, that mass is a double integral of density. Um, we argued on the previous page that a double integral on that domain is an iterated integral with the following bounds and the following choice of uh, uh, differentials. That was the entire previous page to rewrite the double integral as this iterated integral. So we don't have to do that again. We already did that. Um, and then uh, now, the thing I want to comment on, uh, how do you compute this double integral? Uh, Y'all have done stuff like this before. There, the one little twist that happens here, look, look at this inside integral here. It looks a little creepy that the bounds appear to be functions. Look at that. They're functions of x. Right. How do you, how, what do you, does the fundamental number calculus still work when your bounds are functions? And, uh, uh, yes, but more to the point, that's not the right question. In fact, those bounds are not functions. Those are constants for the purposes of what we are doing here. Right? X is a constant while we're doing this inside y integral. So they are just constants. There's nothing to think about in terms of, uh, you know, how does that affect the fundamental theorem? Just plug them in as constants, just like you would have in any other situation, um, uh, uh, like so. Right? Just plug them right into the uh, to the antiderivative formula. So uh, uh, at uh, when we plug in for this uh, top value, y equals x plus 2, like so. Right, when you're plugging in for this bottom value, y is equal to uh, x squared, like so, and off you go. Notice that this remaining integral is a single variable integral, the integral of x. Everything in there is in terms of x. So, count two. Okay. All right, so that's the one little uh, thing. By the way, my little superstition, oh, give me two seconds. My superstition is, uh, you know, even though this there's no policy about this in Calc 1 uh, and 2 classes, uh, I don't like to just write just the formulas here um, like I did up here. Here, it is written right there what the variable is for the purposes of that inside integral. Y is what starts at x squared and ends at x plus 2. All right, so here you can see it. Down here, if you don't explicitly write it yourself, there is no such indication. So my superstition, and I, I think there's really good reasons for this, I write y equals x squared to y equals x plus 2 uh, just as a reminder, to, if only to prevent you from inadvertently plugging that in, perhaps inadvertently for something you're not supposed to. Um, by the way, eventually we'll be doing something called triple integrals. Don't worry about that right now. Uh, but uh, eventually <laughs> there will be more than just the two variables on the inside, and which one do you plug in for can be legitimately confusing. So I think it's a great habit to start, uh, and strongly encourage you to do this. Uh, don't just write the, the functions, write what the variable is that those are equal, equal to. Okay. All right, um, next example is really kind of a quickie. Uh, here, here we have an integral. I'm just going to show that you can do this slicing two different directions, uh, and I want to show you how the bounds change. Uh, it's uh, not like rectangles in a way that will be a nice punchline, but let's, first of all, let's take up this domain here. Uh, let's think about x bounds first. Well, x clearly starts at 0, ends at 1, so x goes from 0 to 1. Now let's fix a value of x. For that value of x, we start at y equals 0. 
right? We end at y equals x. So that was a quick job through going through our slicing process. Right? Um, again, always think in terms of you know bounds are determined by certain points. Points are on certain curves. Curves have certain equations, and that tells you uh, what your bound is. Um, but let's slice the other way now. Let's just see what happens. Take that same domain and let's uh, do our y slicing first. Do your y slicing first. Okay, y goes from 0 to 1. Now then, for a given value of y, uh, x, the x bounds, okay, well, let's be careful about this. The lower bound on that point, that point's on that curve, that curve has that equation. The upper bound is determined by that point, that point is on that curve, and that curve has that equation. Okay. Yeah. Two different ways to slice the same domain. What I want to call your attention to on this one is that this is not the way it was with rectangles. With rectangles, we had this very convenient punchline that if you uh, and you know write this down, you can work this out for yourselves. But if you switch the order of the differentials, you just switch the bounds with it. They're rectangles; that's straight lines. The, you know, the upper bound for x is always the same. The lower bound for x is always the same. It doesn't matter if it's on the inside or the outside. So this lovely, convenient little trick for rectangular domains, very handy, very nice. Not true for non-rectangular domains. Notice that's not what happened here, right? That did not just uh, move over there, and this did not just move over there. Everybody see see the point there? So it's, it is different with non-rectangular domains, yeah. Um, so can we still switch like a rectangular domain? Can you what? Like, is it still going to be for for, rect for a rectangular domain, this works. Yeah, you can just kind of move the inside to the outside and vice versa, and uh, that's fine. For rectangles, only for rectangles. For anything else, it's not going to work. Yeah, right. Um, one thing you might entertain, by the way, uh, <clears throat> as a category of question that's been asked before, I'm sure it'll get asked again, uh, which is uh, the question gives you an iterated integral a clearly non-rectangular domain because that's not a constant. Right? And then they ask you, what would the resulting integral be if you wanted to do the differentials in this other order? How would you, you know, sort of, uh, what's the process of converting one to the <coughs> other? And the answer I would give you on this is don't take a, a, an algebraic point of view on this. Don't think in terms of, oh, okay, well, the, but if I do this, then the, you know, and try to you know, write down some algebra to make it work. Draw the picture. Right? The, the way to, to do this is to say, well, what picture does this represent? And you can just trace it out explicitly. X, it says right here, goes from 0 to 1. Right? It says right here that Y starts at 0 and ends uh, at uh, on the curve Y equals X. Right, so you can see right there in the way the integral, this iterated integral is written, you can see what your domain is. Draw it. Once you have that picture drawn, once you know that this is your picture, well, then you can take that picture and you can just slice it the other direction. And there's your answer. So, for your consideration. Okay. A um, couple other examples. Uh, again, we're just going to be seeing a bunch of examples. Well, a lot of what we're going to be doing is seeing a bunch of examples. There's a moral intended for this example, but I don't want to tell you what the moral is just yet. I want to. I want that to be the surprise at the end, the dramatic effect. Right. So uh, let, for the moment, let's just uh, answer this question. So we've got some double integral. Again, who cares why? Maybe we're computing a mass of something. Whatever. Maybe we're computing a volume under something. Maybe we're com I, I, whatever. Uh, we've got a double integral we want to compute. How would I write this as an iterated uh, integral, we ask, um, uh, with the assumption that this domain, D, is uh, bounded by the following two curves. I'm going to come back and talk about that terminology in a second. But uh, bounded by those two curves, uh, this first curve, y equals x squared, looks like that. 
uh, this second curve, y equals 4, is like this. Now, those two curves chop up the plane into several pieces. Which one is our domain? It's seemingly kind of ambiguous. Uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'm talking about uh, this region <coughs> over here. Maybe that's my domain. Um, the key word here is bounded. D is bounded. <coughs> that means two things. On the one hand, it means that the curves in question uh, make up the boundary of my domain. Well, again, there's several regions whose boundary is made up of these curves. But bounded by means another thing. It also means that the domain is actually bounded, that, it, that you can put a fence around it, that it doesn't run off to infinity in some direction. right? So this little section, if you will, over here runs off to infinity. So does that one, so does that one, so does this one that is sort of, you know, everything sort of beneath. The only one that is actually bounded uh, is this one right here. <coughs> All right, so th the, the first part of these questions is always to actually interpret what does the given algebra tell you your domain actually is. And figuring out what, what the question's asking is part of the question in these cases. So very careful about that. Right? Think very carefully about how the question is phrased, especially this term bounded by, right? And uh, you know, draw your curves and interpret your domain accordingly. Okay, so with this domain having been interpreted, uh, real quick, uh, because we've seen kind of examples like this before, uh, x, well, th these bounds here are determined by those points. Those points are on these two curves. Those two curves have these two equations. Uh, what am I looking for? I am solving for x. Solve for x in these equations. Negative 2 and 2. Right? If y is 4 and y is also x squared, that means that 4 is x squared. So there you go. Okay. Um, Moving along, now we fix a value of x somewhere between negative 2 and 2. Now we ask what's the range of values of y. Well, y is determined by, the y bounds are determined by those two points. Those points are one at a time on that curve with that equation, solve for y. There's that first bound. Second one, upper bound, is determined by that curve, which has that equation, solve for y. There's your upper bound. All right. Well, let's slice it the other way. Let's see what happened. There was no problem with the triangle. You slice it the other way. You get a different iterated integral. Who cares? But anybody have a preference between these two? I, I, I that make much of a difference that I can see. Right. We're going to find it's pretty significantly different in this next example. And there's, so that's the moral. All right. But let's work it. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's work this one out. Um, suppose I do my y slicing first. Y, 0 to 4, no problem. Okay. Um, now we fix a value of y. For that value of y, uh, what is x going to do? Well, x goes like that. It's got bounds determined by those points. Those points are on that one curve with this equation. Here's the twist. Heads up. Don't forget, we're solving for x. you got to solve for x in that equation. Well, which means you're going to have to take a square root. And you get, therefore, plus and minus square root of y. Everybody on board? Um, so again, you know, heads up, a uh, classic standard blunder that students make is just, oh, well, it's that curve. So just I'm just going to take the algebra from that curve, and th I guess that algebra must be what goes here. And I'll see students write in here, you know, uh, x squared, uh, and then they'll be like, oh, wait a second, but that one's x squared. I don't know, maybe that one's negative. I see this kind of stuff a lot, <laughs> right? This is dramatically, dramatically wrong. It, worse, look at this. We have an integral where the bounds on the variable Ah, uh, are in terms of the variable. That doesn't make any sense at all. Right? That's meaningless garbage. So, um, think it through. 
right? You've got to be careful. Whatever you're solving, whatever you're looking for bounds for, that's what you've got to solve for, and you've got to do that algebra, solve for that variable. Um, and, uh, yeah, okay. All right, so now let's compare. Who has a preference between these two? I don't know about y'all. I have a strong preference between these two different choices. Which one uh, would, would I rather uh, work out? And that is, I like this one. It doesn't have square roots in it. Right? I don't know. Maybe I'll have a unnatural affinity to square roots and fractional exponents. I just I feel like it makes my life a little harder. Right? So I would rather do that one, and I would rather not do this one. Um, so that uh, makes you want to ask the question... Uh, how do I avoid the bad one and gravitate toward the good one? And there's a pretty easy answer to this question. Where did these square roots come from? And what made them show up? Well, I, I had to solve for x in that equation. Right? The thing that's, uh, you know, you look in this algebra here, what you would naturally call, I think, uh, the independent variable in that equation I had to solve for it why did I have to solve for it? well I had to solve for it because that's what you do to the variable that's on the inside well I don't like solving for my independent variables when I have to solve for an independent variable I have to typically invert a function in this case it was a square root what if it was an exponential now I've got to take logs right um, so the moral is, whichever one is your independent variable in whatever algebra you're dealing with, <coughs> but you, don't, you very naturally don't want to have to solve for, don't put it on the inside, thus guaranteeing that you're going to have to solve for it. Right? Put it on the outside. So don't put it on the inside. Put it on the outside. Then you don't have to solve for it. Here, notice uh, you know, the way I wanted to do things, what I have to solve for is y. Cool, I like solving for y. It's already solved for because it's my dependent variable. Right? So that's the big idea. Try as much as possible, reasonably to the you know, extent you can, uh, put your uh, dependent variable on the inside, put your independent variable on the outside. All right, there's the moral. Here's another example, and I'm gonna have to go quickly with this one. Um, so suppose we've got this uh, triangle with these corners like so. Suppose I want to do the integral of my y slicing first like that. You can see y goes from 0 to 1. Uh, then we pick for a given value of y. What's my range of values of x? Okay, well, these points are on these curves that have these certain equations. By the way, on this one, you do have to figure out what the equations are. Sometimes the equations aren't given, but you know the points, and you can look at the picture. You can see which curves connect which two lines, and you can derive those equations, and you can solve for those x bounds. Details for y'all um, are that and that, and this integral's shaped up pretty much just fine. Right? Okay. Let's do it the other way then. I don't know. Why not? By the way, you look at the, the, the three different curves, right? I'm not scared of the algebra on any of those. Right? That looks pretty straightforward. So why shouldn't I be able to do it the other way? Uh, let's do our x slicing first. x goes from, you see here, 0 to 2. And there's a temptation to say, well, okay, x goes from 0 to 2. Make that on the outside. And then uh, let's pick a value of x. And uh, there's my uh, range of values for y. Y starts at that point, which is on that curve. No problem. <coughs> but then look at our upper bound. Our upper bound is determined by that point, which is on, well, I mean, it's on that curve for, uh, for these values of x. But over here, for different values of x, that upper bound point is on a different curve. So which one do you use? And the answer is you can't just pick one. You've got to you've got to break this problem up. You've got to say, look, this question is fundamentally different for these values of x between zero and one. When x is between zero and one, 
then I can, uh, let's see here, oh, I, I'm just going to try to make some better color choices. Uh, then this is my picture, lower curve, upper curve, y goes from 0 to x. But for these values of x, when x is between 1 and 2, it's just not. That green curve is uh, irrelevant. That green curve goes way up here. Uh, there's nothing over here. I've got, I've got no interest in any of this junk. You can't use that green curve for the orange values of x. Right? So you just, you've got to recognize that, well, for these values of x, uh, my lower bound, my upper bound, that upper bound point is on that curve. It has a different equation, and therefore I get different bounds for y. You might see what happened here. Highly undesirable. Now I'm doing two integrals. Who would rather do two integrals when you can instead do just one integral, right? <laughs> Unless you really just enjoy doing iterated integrals. Uh, clearly, this is uh, inferior. This is a suboptimal <laughs> choice. Okay, so let's trace it back again. Let's try to you know post mortem here. How can we avoid this in the future? The problem was that uh, these upper bounds are different. That's the problem. Why are those upper bounds different? Well, because they're determined by points that are fundamentally different. Why are those points fundamentally different? Because they're on two different curves. And the next question, how did the point jump from the one curve <coughs> to the other curve? This point jumped from the one to the other curve because the curves intersected. <coughs> and typically when curves intersect, they make a corner. So this is why we try not to slice through corners. If you slice through a corner, you're creating a situation where your upper bound or your lower bound, one or the other of the bounds, is going to jump from one curve to another curve. Therefore, from your your bound's going to go from one equation to a different equation. Therefore, one, va one upper formula to a, a different upper bound formula and you're going to have to break up your integral into two separate integrals, which is which is no good. So try not to slice through corners. That's the punchline there. Okay. Okay. Um, I am going to actually skip these next two pages. Uh, this is pretty easy reading, uh, and uh, we're behind schedule, and it's important that we stay up to schedule. I mean... Uh, it's always the case. It's, uh, we just don't never have enough time in this class, and so I'm always going to be making tough choices about what to leave for you guys to study on your own and what for me to you know to focus class time on. The two quick things I will point to here is that uh, you know some nice punchlines. When you're doing double integrals, the algebra has certain properties that you that you'll recall from single variable calculus, such as you can factor constants out just like with single variable integrals. Uh, if you have a sum on the inside, you can break that integral up as a sum of two corresponding separate integrals. That's just like in single variable calculus. So I just want to point out uh, those. Uh, there's a couple other facts down here. Uh, whoops. Uh, this is a uh, neat fact. I'm going to let you guys read and think about that on your own. Likewise, uh, this one, uh, and finally uh, this one. Uh, th these are, um, uh, e like I say, easy reading, and uh, so uh, read through those. A couple of related examples. These are all things that you can figure out on your own. Um, obviously, as always, if you have any questions, come to office hours. Um, I do want to, in the next minute, uh, talk very quickly about uh, another application. We're going to see, again, zillions of applications. Here's the next one. Uh, suppose I have two surfaces... like that and that, and I want to compute the volume in between them. Right, that's a reasonable question uh, to ask. Um, <clears throat> let me remind you that when we do applications like this, um, a uh, relatively unimportant part of the application is to actually get the answer. It's not really what we're here for. Right? Um, applications are really opportunities for us to exercise our understanding of what we're really interested in. In this case, what we're interested in is um, uh, using Riemann sums, You know, learning how to look at a question and see how a Riemann sum answers the question. So let me recognize that, yes, I, I fully understand that you could compute that yellow volume 
by computing this blue volume, right, and subtracting this green volume. Yeah, sure, that would do it. Um, and we already know how to compute those two volumes. Right, it's one of our first applications. Uh, I don't want to do that. Again, that's uh, that's a great way to get an answer. We're not here for answers. I want to talk about how this question allows us to uh, to address a Riemann sum. And so, uh, the, oh, and I am out of time. So uh, we're going to come at this question next time from the point of view of how can I use a Riemann sum to directly address this question. All right, see you all later. And uh, by the way, I have two things. First of all, some of y'all came in after I uh, did attendance. Make sure I get you marked off. Second of all, I have homeworks to return, so please stick around for just a moment.